Wow, we're back. A couple of seconds late. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless our time together. I ask you to draw in those who you'd have be here today. I ask you to reveal uh, who we are in Christ and what you want us to get out of today's lesson. And I ask you to bless us. And I thank you for this book that was written by James so many years ago and what we're learning from it. I ask you to bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. It's good to see you all. So um, we're back. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so let me um, do this. So we're in uh, James 4, verse 13 and 14. We've been there a little while, but there's a lot for us to get out of this. And so, hey, Liz, it's good to see you. Um, thank you for your mic, mic drop late, earlier on my comment about uh, boundaries. Very cool. Appreciate it. Um, and so we're in James 4, 13 and 14 still. And basically, we have been talking last time about how um, it's okay to make plans. Hey, Gary, it's good to see you. It's okay to make plans, but it's a little arrogant to presume that whatever we want to decide will go on um, because we're people is what will happen. And, and he says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, We'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I said earlier that there's nothing in the last in the last um, session that there's nothing wrong with making plans. I think it's smart to make plans. It's wise to do so which must just one first should submit our plans to the Lord and do what we sense he would have us to do. And two, always be ready to change our plans if it looks like he wants to do that. Now, uh, Luke, who, who um, wrote the book of Acts, details in the book of Acts a case where this happens to Paul and him self because he was with Paul and the others that are with him and I think it's worthwhile for us to see this um, and the reason that's important is because often in the body of Christ people will say well I, I wanted to do this thing but I apparently missed the Lord because it didn't work out the way I thought it would and I don't necessarily believe that's completely true all the time Hey, Lan. Hope you're feeling well. So here in Acts 16, verses 6 through 8, now when they had gotten through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia. Apparently, they're on a, a worldwide trip of places that's hard to say, you know, place names that are hard to say. Uh, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Lord did not permit them. The Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, or Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to those in Macedonia. We can see from this true story that we always must be ready to abandon our little plans should we receive instruction for the Lord to do something else. And of course, this means also that we should be expecting direction from the Lord via the Holy Spirit of God, that, that we should expect that, which is a problem in some forms of church because in those forms of church, uh, 
that tell us that God isn't speaking anymore. And I, I really have searched the scriptures and haven't found one place that even comes close to saying that God's going to stop talking to us except through the word of God. Now, I've taught multiple books of the Bible, and I have a bookcase over here full of Bibles, and my first one's in the car. It's all wore out. Um, I obviously believe that the Bible is valid. I love the Bible. I seek direction from the Bible. However, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, would guide us. And, and he does. And it's not just through the written word of God, because the New Testament was, was in existence at the time uh, that was written. And so the Holy Spirit was literally telling him what to do. And, and there's no reason for him to stop doing that now. There are so many issues that come up in everyday life. And as much as I love the Bible, they're not mentioned there. It doesn't tell you what to do when this happens to your friend or what happens. What do you do when this? It's, we need guidance from God right now. Lord, what shall we do? So I think we should always be asking him his direction on what we should do about things. <clears throat> Can't seem to clear my throat today. Um, and we should be ready to abandon our plans. So that doesn't mean that I won't have any. I mean, if you had seen my schedule last week at, at the beginning, I had so many sessions and so many meetings set up that I was fully prepared to do, and about two-thirds of them fell apart. Some of them at the last minute, people not showing up, not, or people canceling for various reasons, or people being sick. And we can roll with that, but but uh, I don't see how we can go about functioning in the kingdom of God without having some kind of plan on what we expect will happen. And whenever we abandon that because the Lord is guiding us a different way, or because circumstances which none of none of which escape Him uh, happen, like someone being sick that we can look at it that way and go, well, the Lord always knew how it would be. So James offers <clears throat> an alternative way to live. So instead of, he says, saying today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and we'll make a profit there. And, uh, whereas, and he says, whereas you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Your life is like a vapor that's going to come and be gone in a short amount of time. He offers a different way. I didn't post that scripture that I read earlier. That was the verse out of Acts that I read. When you do this for yourself, sometimes you drop the ball. Um, the next verse, James in verse 4.15 says this. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this. We'll do that. What is the benefit of living like this? Well, it takes God into account as a foundation for every single thing that we do. It's an active recognition that God is sovereign and is intentionally directive in our lives. When, when I was introduced to this concept many years ago in Houston and I began to practice it, it's like <clears throat> God didn't come more alive for me because he was already alive. But I experienced that life more readily because I was opening my mind up to his direction and I was aware of it because I was expecting it. It seems to me that we lose awareness of the importance of God's personal actions in our lives when we presume that we're even going to be alive tomorrow, much less what we'll be doing tomorrow if we live through the night. 
Now, you know, I'm, I'm fully expecting to be alive tomorrow. I might be wrong, but I'm fully expecting that. And I don't want to live a, a, a life of fear that I might not be alive tomorrow. But it, I also don't want to live in arrogance that I can decide what to do with my own life all the time. Meanwhile, instant by instant, God chooses that we remain alive. We should never forget that. We should forget, we should never forget, hey, Joe Yarborough, we should never forget that we are alive every moment by the grace and mercy of God. And he decides we're going to do that. We're going to be breathing. And I think that's a cool thing. Because it talks about intentionality. It talks about he's still on this journey with us and doing something. In James 4, 16, look at that. Suddenly we blast off when we do two whole verses in one 15-minute segment. Woohoo! We're rocking. We're rocking now. Sometimes we stampede like a herd of turtles, and sometimes we move a little quicker. And it's a little easier in these shorter less complex verses. He says, but now you boast in your arrogance. And he says, oh, all such boasting is evil. Now the word boast can also mean rejoice. James tells them they're rejoicing in their pridefulness. And that is a double no-no spiritually. Not only are they doing something that God hates because it's not healthy for them to do it, being prideful, but they're boasting about it. No wonder James says it's evil. And the Greek word uh, translated as evil is a word poneros, P-O-N-E-R-O-S. And it's translated as evil in English. The word evil, <clears throat> what makes something evil? It's because literally it means something that's hurtful. So here we have a God who built us. He knows how we work. He knows what will be healthy for us. He knows what to put in us for us to put in us for that will function well. Pridefulness is hurtful. It hurts the human being and other human beings. And so therefore it's not good to put in to a human. So Satan puts pridefulness into a human. He gets us to boast on our pridefulness whether we realize we're doing that or not. In other words, James isn't calling them names. He's acknowledging that such behavior is truly and actually harmful to them. And if it's harmful to them, it's harmful to others around them. As we come to this next verse, verse 17, which is the last verse in chapter 4, it would be good to remember, for us to remember, that this is the letter, it's not a book. In this verse, James is going to do something interesting. He's going to look like he does a subject change. But remember, this is, this is a letter, so we don't have chapter breaks in letters. Somebody put that in there a few centuries ago to make it easier for us to study and to find our place. But there was no chapter break in the letter. So he goes directly from your boasting is all evil to this next verse. Which to him is a logical next step. Hey, Michael Newman, it is good to see you. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. So he does something interesting. He uses what seems like an almost random comment to sum up everything he's written so far. What we know as James chapters 1 through 4. It's also very possible that James was remembering something that Jesus taught. And here we have it from, from John reporting what Jesus taught. And 
And remember, all three of us have been doing this. Whenever I find, whenever I find a verse that goes back to something Jesus might have said, I note it. Because I think it's important to see the common thread, but also to know that all these people in the first century church that wrote these things were all, they were all impacted by Christ. And, and you know what? If we read and, and we look at uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and James as true events, which I believe they are, and we read them experientially, they'll, they'll impact us too. Jesus, 2,000 years after he ascended into heaven, is still affecting people. He's still influencing people if we let him. So Jesus said, and it's reported in John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Well, what if you don't? Well, then you won't be blessed by, by doing the right thing. And we tend to think about sin having to do, to do with things we actively think or do. And Jesus made it a point. Jesus made it a point to say that when we know what to do and to do them, we're blessed. This means that if we don't do them, even though we know to do them, we won't be blessed by this thing that God would have us to do for our blessing. I just don't think we should run around and, and try to figure out a formula to gain God's favor. I believe we have God's favor. I mean, where's children? Hey, Joel, thank you for being here. And thank you for saying that. Thank you for letting me know that you're in the room. Um, I don't think we should run around trying to earn God's favor because, heck, we're his children. I think we get, we get his favor. <clears throat> However, I do believe that we have an active part to play in our own our own destiny here. We can change the course of our destiny by stepping away with, from what God's intentions are for us. And we can enhance the way our life operates by doing things we know he wants us to do and we can and we can do to the, we can work to the detriment of our own lives. We can hurt our own lives by knowing we're supposed to do something and then not doing it. James said, therefore to him who knows to do good. Hey, Debbie Rowe, it's good to see you. Been a while. Um, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. It is a sin to choose to not do what's right. It's optional. But it will, it will have an effect. As James clarifies, it is sin when we know to do good and we don't do it. In other words, we have no excuse for not loving our neighbor. Oh, we can come up with them. But really, if we have a chance to bless another person, why don't we do it? What holds us back from doing it? Sometimes it's uncomfortable. So what? I I I I um challenge you to look at all the good things in life and see if most of them don't have an uncomfortable aspect to them. I just think it's uncomfortable to be a Christian. It's uncomfortable to go forward and receive Jesus as your Lord. It's it's uncomfortable to go confess sin. It's uncomfortable to give sometimes. It's uncomfortable. So what? Life has been uncomfortable since the beginning. Discomfort can be holy. I think it could be a good thing. We spend most of our lives trying not to feel any discomfort. If we do not love our neighbors, our neglect will be considered by God to be sin because we know God's expectations of us. And you know, his expectations aren't that wild. I, one, one of my sons, I have two sons, one of my sons um, did something once and it was so out of character for him. And and um, 
And I sat down with him. I'm not going to embarrass him so you can guess which, which of the two it was, and I won't acknowledge it. But, but um, I sat down and I said, you know, last night I heard your mother talking to someone and describing you as being ethical and having good morals and being honest and trustworthy and true. And I said, I said, did your actions today look like that? And he started to cry. And he said, no, no, sir, it didn't. And I said, no, it didn't. What you did wasn't truthful. It wasn't trustworthy. And I said, you know what I think about what your mom said last night? But he didn't want to hear it because he thought I was going to blast him. I said, I think she was right. I think that's who you really are. I said, we're not expecting you to go beyond what you're able to do. We're just expecting you to be your very best self if possible. That's what I believe the Lord requires of us. <clears throat> we have been plucked out of the miry clay, he says. We're not who we used to be. We were dead and we were headed to hell. We've been picked up. Our sins have been washed away. We're alive in Christ. All he, and with children of light, it says, and in, in, I think it's on Ephesians 5, and, and we're, um, we're children of the Most High God. All I think he wants from us is for us to act like it. Jesus came to the earth because he loved his neighbors, and those neighbors were us. And he's just expecting us to be who we are. How hard is that? Thank you, Deanne. Thanks for letting me know, know you're here. How hard is it for us to be who we are? Here's, here's the problem with that. Before we go into chapter 5. Because most of us, even those who've been in church our whole lives, which I wasn't one of those, most of us have been in Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches without a whole bunch of extra man-made junk, um, really don't have a clue about who we are in Christ. We really don't know who we are. We don't know what he did to change us. We don't know how different we really are. And I, I want to challenge you. And if you don't want to know, invite me to where you are and I'll teach it. Because this was the most mind-blowing revelation I ever had after Dan Ledford convinced me that Jesus really was real and that salvation was a real thing and that God was real. And after that, when I realized what he did, and I'm still learning, I just don't think we're ever going to know the enormity of what he has done in every single Christian person, male or female. But if we pursue that, we will know who we are. We are, if you ask me, who do you think you are? And believe me, there are some people that don't like me and they've asked me that. And I tell them, I know exactly who I am. I am in Christ. And if you study that term, in Christ, in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus, in the beloved, in the Son, any of those terms and look at what's attached to it, those are our qualities. I asked our son, to behave like he really is. And you know, ever since he has. And, and um, actually both of them do. And, and my daughter does. And it's just pretty amazing to see it. But if you don't know who you are, Debbie Rose says, do we have to step out of our comfortable areas? The Holy Spirit leads us. Don't second guess God. We go into the byways and highways, spread God's word. If you have a feeling of prayer for someone, do it. The devil is not the author of confusion, and God will be with us. That's right, Debbie. I think I'm, I'm tired of saying I'll pray for it later. Let's do it now. This is one of the reasons that as parents and as spiritual parents and as pastoral people and shepherd-type people, it's important for us to not just focus on what someone else does wrong because that does not characterize them unless they're completely bereft of any holiness at all. If they're not born again, then that is who they are. If they're lost, 
they're supposed to act like lost people. But if they're not lost, then whatever they do that doesn't look saved doesn't characterize them. And if we just dwell on what they did wrong or what they do wrong, then they'll never step into their destiny because they'll never get a grip on who they really are. We must be reminded from now, every now and then, about who we are in the Lord. We're holy, we're pure, we're blameless. Not to say we don't make mistakes and sin, but that's what God says. He washes us clean. I just challenge us as, as before we get into chapter 5 to go after that. And if anybody wants me to teach that instead of a Bible book, man, I'll gladly teach you. I have a whole conference on it that I do. You get me there and I'll do it. As you go into chapter 5, which, by the way, starts with a startling verse, remembering this, remembering this will help us to understand James's passion. And I want to remind us that I know people in this room, in this chat room right now, if that's what you call this thing, that people think are angry people. And they're not. They're passionate people. And there's a difference. And sometimes I have been characterized <clears throat> as a as a um, as an angry person because I'm, I get I get psyched up. I get passionate. I'm doing it right now, and I didn't set up to do that. I wanted to really give my give my voice a rest today, but but that's just the way it works, right? Um, and so, what he's gonna say is, it's gonna be a few pages of my text. Where he's gonna say something. I'm not gonna post it because I don't want us to focus on that. But he's gonna say, "Come now, you rich, weep and howl." for your miseries that are coming upon you. And what I'm going to do is work us up to that verse. Because I want to set a, a, a foundation for something, and I think we're really going to see some stuff in Chapter 5 that's sure, really been exciting to write. <clears throat> Whether we're wealthy in money or not, or whether or not one is born again, there is a chance people depend on earthly riches to be our savior. Have you noticed that? We will depend on money, finances, to make sure we're okay. And you know, I mean, we have a ministry and it takes money to run it. We have a household that takes money to live. We've got to pay for gas and food and all that good stuff. Um, internet, you know. Um, Money is not an evil thing. And you'll hear people say, money is evil, and it's not. That's not what it says. It says the, the root, money is, is the love of money is the root of evil. He says, he says loving it is. I'll show you that in 1 Timothy 6 to 10. I haven't really lost my stride here. I'm just um, almost twitching with, with um, anticipation. Paul writes to Timothy in the first letter to Timothy, <clears throat> Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, that's an amazing experience. For, who, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Many of our brothers and sisters are not. I haven't been at times. I've lost it for stuff. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I'm going to post this definition because I can't say this word in Greek. 
<laughs> and I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm from New Orleans. You know, and we're lucky I speak English. Um, the Greek word translated as love of money is that. Phila guria, I don't know. It has a form of the word phileo, P-H-I-L-E-O, in it which refers to brotherly love. So why is the love of money associated with all kinds of evil? Perhaps it's because we will devote ourselves to it in our own greed to the exclusion of other people. We will love what we can get from money more than our brother's need matters to us. People who love money and the security they think it brings will often do and say unspeakable things to those God would have them to love if they become desperate from not having enough money. They will say horrible things. They will do horrible things. They will call horrible names. They will gossip, slander. They will be hateful. Perhaps it's because we would devote ourselves to it and our own greed is why it's evil. Jesus tells us to love our brother, love our neighbor, Matthew 22, 39. And this, and this demon, the love of money, will have us hate our neighbor and love it instead. And this cannot please the Lord. There is a deeper reason the love of money is a bad thing. Depending upon it makes it into an idol, a replacement for the real God in our lives. And he has never taken lightly this sort of thing. I mean, in the Ten Commandments, look, how, look at how it starts. says, you shall serve no other gods. Love of money is a small g god. You shall not make for yourself the carved image. Any likeness of anything that is on heaven above or that is in the earth below, beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow to them nor serve them. For I, your Lord God, am a jealous God. People don't realize they do this, but they don't bow to money when money has a grip on their souls. I, I own a feel like good. Well, that thanks, Liz, but ah, it sounds the same to me. Um, <laughs> um, I want to make a plug for a book that I'm reading right now. It's called this. I think it's called this. It's out in paperback right now. I mean, hardback right now. I bought it. It's excellent. If you want to understand what's happening in the Western world right now, it's a, it's a hard book to read, but read the book. Real short chapters. The hardness of it is so true. And and it's um, from abortion to uh, the worship of the, the perverse in our streets. It, it all goes back to uh, pagan gods that were driven out of the Holy Land, you know, out of, out of the promised land. But um, read it and see what see what you think. I think he's this guy's got, got a great point, and hopefully he's got some answers. Uh, I know the answer ultimately is depend upon the Lord. Christian people who love money never realize that they're worshiping money. They never realize they're worshiping the demon behind the idolatry, behind every idol, is a demonic presence. They never seem to realize they're neglecting God and, and dishonoring him by hurting the very people he has allowed into their lives. If we love money to the exclusion of the, our neighbor, then we won't take care of the people around us when we can and when God's directing us to, because all we can think about is taking care of ourselves. We're actually dishonoring God who put those people near us by excluding them out of our lives. Many of us have heard stories of Christians, including some leaders, 
who have cheated others in financial deals, who have split congregations so as to get control of some of the, the host church's assets, and outright stolen things from other people. Why did they do that? Even some Christian leaders. And it all comes down to the same thing. Why do people, why do Christians rip one another off? Because they lack faith that God will supply their needs as he has promised they would. It's the same reason that so many Christians employ manipulative tactics to get what they need. It's because they really don't believe that God's going to supply their needs. They believe that it's important to do something, even something that God says not to do, or to not do something that God says to do so they can get theirs. And it's because they don't trust that God will come through with what he promised. So they give their worship to money to protect them and to provide for them. In Exodus 20, the, quote, the verse I just quoted, God made it quite clear that he is a jealous God and that he won't tolerate the worship of false gods which cannot be trusted. It would be good to pray, for us to pray and ask the Lord if we, if you, if we trust anything over him. Because eventually he's going to have enough of that. If we don't repent, he will either withdraw his presence from us, not kicking out of our place in heaven, but will withdraw his presence from us, knowing we won't even notice or care. Or, and that breaks my heart to hear it. Or he will break that false God in our eyes. People worship all sorts of things. They'll worship money, health, work. They'll worship other people. Some good, some are good things. In, in general, though, none. Uh, in general, but none are Almighty God, and none can really measure up to Him. If our object of worship is money, for example, the symptom of this will be our foul behavior towards another whenever money gets tight. What will it look like when God breaks that false God for someone? Well, that person might lose everything they have, including a place to live. So they'll be worshiping money so they won't become homeless and might lose everything and become homeless because they're worshiping a false God. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't make sense to live that way, but the logic train as it makes sense that's what is literally happening for sure our loving God doesn't want anyone to be homeless but he cares more about our eternal souls than he does about our physical lives and he cares about our physical lives plenty of plenty of evidence for that in the scriptures especially in the uh, gospels here's one instant here's one thing that Jesus said about that. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Why are we discussing all this? As James continues his letter into what we know as chapter 5, he's going to warn his original readers and us about what he says here, about the miseries that are coming as God breaks dependence upon false gods. And that's why James 5 starts out like this. Oops. I have to cut and paste from my text. 
because uh, I don't have anybody to help me do it. Um, um, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Now, the word rich comes from another bewildering uh, Greek word, says P L O U S I O S, plousios, plousios. Although we might consider it to refer to people who have a lot of money or material wealth, it really has to do with any abundance. Anything that is in abundance. Think about this, because this is true. Everyone is rich in something. For some, it's money. For some, it's physical health. For some, it's connections to others who have power. To some, some people are rich in patience, and sometimes I am, and sometimes I ain't, you know. But, but for the most part, everybody has something. You know, one of my friends is rich in hospitality. So, so many people have stayed in her home with her. And when you go to her home, she cooks you an Oklahoma breakfast that will knock your socks off. She doesn't have to do any of it. She just is rich in hospitality. The main thing to keep in mind here is that James is addressing riches of any kind that a believer might trust. It'd be good to ask the Lord, what am I rich in? The main thing to keep in mind is that James is addressing riches of any kind that a believer might trust instead of God. For, for too many of us, I mean, I mean, people will trust their intellect instead of God. And they don't have the intellect except that God gave it to them. For all too many of us, our faith is in something from the earth and not from him. The devil knows this since he put that faith in something in the earth inside of us. So it's very easy for him to cause us despair, fury, violent thoughts, etc., just by causing us to lack whatever earthly thing or person it is we trust to be our small g God over the real God who never goes away and never stops loving us and never stops wanting to protect us and provide for us. Oh, I want to keep going, but it's 745, and I think we ought to stop here because there's so much, there's so much in these verses. And we'll pick up again in James 5.1 next week. Um, well, I'll wipe myself out today. Um, so we'll, we'll pick up here next time. Uh, I appreciate your comments. I think, you know, this could be one of those come to Jesus studies where it makes you think. But really, think about what made you explode against somebody, especially someone in your presence, um, most recently. And chances are, if you ask God, he'll show you what thing um, you were worshiping instead of him. It's a simple test. It's a litmus test. You can tell what's in there. Now, every single thing I said applies to me. There is no one elevated in the body of Christ. Um, no matter what our titles, our education, or the initials in front of or behind our names, Jesus is the head and we are the body. We all have our parts. So as we go on, we're going to see James is pretty passionate. <laughs> um, and that's a hard verse. Come now, you who, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. James doesn't want to see them, but he knows they're coming because he's watched it. He's seen it happen. Maybe it happened to him. Let's close with a prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for those who take the time to spend here studying your word with us and studying your word on their own, at their house, on a Bible or a Bible app. Um, I thank you that we live in a time 
in which so many people have so much access to the Word of God, even in nations where they're forbidden to worship our Lord. I thank you that we can get to these things. We can read these Bibles for ourselves. We can wear them out, that become a part of who we are. I thank you that your Holy Spirit guides us. No matter how many times you read something, to see something we've never seen before, because we never needed it like we need it right now. So I thank you for that. And I ask you to bless us, Father, um, in the week to come. I ask you to keep us well. I ask you to uh, protect all of us. I ask you to, uh, those who, I know there are people in the room right now that a part of what they do uh, is grow things. Um, uh, grass and, and uh, hay and, and, uh, and food. And Father, for that to happen, they need water. They need sunshine, and then they need uh, dry dirt for them to harvest it in. And so I ask you to provide that. And I ask you to provide uh, the income for those who are in the room who need that right now. Um, the perfect job for anybody that might be without one right now. Anyone who is um, physically failing or not doing well, Father, we ask you to pour your blessings out on them. Give them... Um, Give them the ability to think about how to take care of themselves best. And I just thank you for the people who come in these studies to be with us, be a part of us uh, here, now, and later on on YouTube. I praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can pray for my voice. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit raspy today. It wasn't from yelling at football. I didn't do, didn't do that. This video will be, if you look on that website, um, uh, you can go there and, and you can um, you can see last year's, thank you, Debbie. Um, you can look at last week's study. There's a whole bunch of them. You can go to YouTube. There's, I did Ephesians and Acts and John and, I don't know what we're going to do after we do this one. I'm enjoying James so much. Um, they take me a lot longer than, than I ever realized. Also, if you like to read, um, we got well over 250 articles there, and uh, that'll keep you busy if you're laying in bed. Um, and there's good there's, there's articles by other people, too. So God bless you all. I love you all. I'll see you next time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for telling me you're here. And thank you for your comments when you had them. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.